Good morning, brothers and sisters. I want to praise God and give thanks to him for this morning, for the opportunity to come before you and to share his word with you this morning. But before I start, I have a request or a favour to ask. As I speak to you this morning, I would like you to pray for me and that God will bless us together as we study his word and that we will be changed and transformed by his grace and his power of his word. Before we start, let's just bow our heads with a prayer, please. Father in heaven, as we come together and to study your word, I, I beseech thee, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be present here, each head bowed here this morning, each family represented. May we be filled with your Spirit, Father, to live the life that you want us to live, that we may be witnesses for Christ in all our dealings with people, wherever we are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of uh, the, the uh, sermon this morning is Conviction and Conversion. Here we have two words that sound similar, but there are many meaning of them is very different. In order for us to understand the difference, allow me to use an illustration. I own a Volkswagen Amarok, uh, the colour of it's blue. Now, my beautiful wife, Michelle, tells me that men are more susceptible to colour blindness than our fairer sex. I'm not suggesting that I'm colour blind, but I might have a problem with uh, colour coordination. What if I was to say to you that it's green? Now, you know, I'm an open person. I want to know the truth. So how can you prove to me and help me to see that that Amarok is blue and not green? Because, ask the woman. Because okay. I want to know what's the true colour of that vehicle. You could compare it against something that is green to see the difference or against something that is blue to see the similarity. Okay, so now you've convinced me, perhaps even convicted me, that the car is blue and not green. Has this changed me as a person? Has this changed my character? Has it changed my life? No. You see, conviction has to do with the mind and the way we think. Conversion, however, is a life-changing event in one's life, performed by the Holy Spirit. It's a 180 degree turnaround. It's hating the things you used to love and loving the things you used to hate. It's a complete turnaround, a complete life changer. The dictionary says that conviction is a state of being convinced, a fixed or firm belief. Conversion, turned about, opposite, direction or action to change into something different, to be transformed. We can be convicted of many things. We can be convicted that it's right to pay 10% of our gross income and tithe of our wages. We can be convicted that it's the seventh day of the week is God's Sabbath day of rest, the true Sabbath day, the day that God sanctified and blessed and set aside and that we are to keep it holy. We can be convicted that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came to this world and died that we might live. We are even convicted that he is coming back for the second time to receive those that are faithful unto him. But are we converted? What are our lives showing? That we are converted? We come to church. It's very easy to show one side of ourselves here, but when we're at home or at work, what are our lives revealing outside of the church environment? I'm going to fire a couple of questions at you. Don't answer them, but just think about them and dwell upon them. Wives, if you were asked what your husbands are like at home, is he an ambassador for Christ? Is he Christ-like? What would your answer be? Husbands, if you were asked what your, is your wife like at home, is she an ambassador for Christ? Is she Christ-like? We are told to examine ourselves in 2 Corinthians 13.5 to see whether you be in the faith. 
and that Jesus is in you. Let's go back to Christ Day. Being good Seventh-day Adventists, I hope that you have your Bibles and I hope that you might have your devices here. Turn with me. We're going to consider Peter, his life and his experience. Matthew 16 and verses 13 to 16. Matthew 16, verses 13 to 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was convicted that Jesus was the Son of the living God. Are we convicted that Jesus is the Son of the living God? Yes. Let's consider John 6. Turn over to John chapter 6. And we're going to consider verses 68 through to 69. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter is not only convinced, but he is sure that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was convicted, but was not converted. Let's find out. Consider, let's turn over to Luke 22. Luke 22. In verses 31 to 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that ye may be sit, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. After all these things, Peter has said, Jesus tells him that he is not converted. How many years did Peter spend with Christ? Three and a half years of his ministry. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He travelled with him. He slept with him. Ate with him. Even sailed with him on the lake. He was by Christ's side and witnessed the miracles. All of them. And after all this, Jesus still says that Peter is not converted. How do you think Peter felt when he heard these words, these things from Christ? We see his response in verse 33 of chapter 22 of Luke. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. By saying this, Peter is trying to prove to Jesus that he is converted and willing to die for him. But what did Jesus say back? Verse 34. And he said, I, will, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall, crow, shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We all know what happened that night after Jesus was taken away. Poor Peter, just as Jesus had said, he proved to himself that he was not converted. Now, why is Peter's experience revealed to us? Let's turn over to Romans 15.4. Romans 15.4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It was written for our benefit so that we can learn from it. How many of us in the church today are reliving, reliving Peter's experience? How many of us profess to be followers of Christ and say that we are ready to die for him? How can we say that we are ready to die for Christ when we don't even sacrifice one hour, half an hour of our day in study and Bible and prayer? How can we say that we are ready to stand up for Christ against kings and rulers and like officials when a lot of us cower away 
and try to avoid the subject when at work or even among friends? How many opportunities do we have every day to lift up Christ, our Saviour, and reveal him to others, but we just walk away, we turn away, and we let it pass, and sometimes it passes to eternity. How can we say that we are converted? The question is, what are our lives showing? Are our lives bringing forth good fruit? Turn with me to John 15. Let us consider John 15, verses 1 to 2. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Are we the branch that gets taken away? Or are we the branch that gets purged by God so that we can bring forth more fruit? Are we making use of every opportunity that God gives us to bear fruit? The question is, why is conversion so essential for our salvation? Just turn back to John 3, 1 to 3. John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can... Do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Without conversion, without being born again, without this change of life and character, we cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus had everything. He was highly educated, wealthy, an honoured man, a ruler of the Jews. He knew the scriptures but he didn't know Jesus. Maybe it's the same with us. Maybe it's a conversion is what we need to know Jesus personally, to have a personal and intimate relationship with him. How can we share something, something with others that we don't have ourselves? How can we give someone our happiness and our hope and our joy if we don't possess it, possess it ourselves? Nicodemus had everything, money, power, friends but still something was missing he was not content the way that he was and the same is the same is with some of us we all have a vacuum in our hearts and i have heard it preached that this vacuum in the heart is the shape of god people trying try to fill this hole with all sorts of different things or rubbish and try to be find happiness immorality drugs alcohol some try and find it at work, some strive to get rich thinking that money will make them happy. But this true happiness can only be found in pleasure seeking, can, cannot be found in pleasure seeking, fame, power or riches. True happiness is the only thing that can be, fill this vacuum and it can only be found in a person. Only by knowing Jesus and having a personal relationship with him can we find true happiness. He sees of himself in John 15, 11. Just turn with me to John 15, 11, please. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. How much happier can we be if our joy is full? The only reason we are not happy 100% in our lives is because we don't know Jesus. And we're not having a relationship with him. To me, there is no reason why we shouldn't be the happiest people in the world because we have Jesus Christ in every aspect of our lives. And we are so privileged to know the truth. Referring to John 15, 11, it says, What are these things, that I question, what are these things I have spoken to you, unto you? It's the everlasting gospel, the Bible. Christ has spoken these things in a love letter to each one of us, the Bible is a love letter to you. What do we do when we receive a love letter? We rip it open, read it as fast as we can. 
But, you know, when my mum used to write to me when I was in Papua New Guinea, we, it was only teletexts. We had no other communication. And when I used to get a letter from my mum, I used to rip it open. And it'd go in a pocket, but it wasn't long before it'd come back out again. You know, and you get on with life. But it's not long, as I said, before it comes out again. And we can't help ourselves as, as we read it again and again. So how can we receive these things which Christ has spoken to, to us if we don't re read them? For the young people, it's like getting a text message of a dear friend. Your phone goes off and you see there's a message there, but you don't read it. You just put it back in your pocket. You've received the message, but has it benefited you? No. Why? Because you haven't read it. How can his joy remain in us if it's not there to start with? When we start reading and believing and acting on the promises of God, that's when they will start being fulfilled in our lives. And I guarantee you of this, brother, brothers and sisters, I have proved it over and over again in my life. When I have been down in the gutter in my Christian experience and thinking, God doesn't care, you get up, you claim the promises of God, and the blessings flow. He will be with you. And your life will change. No longer will you need to try and find happiness in earthly things. The scripture says in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. And Christ tells us in John 10.10, 10, The thief, which is Satan, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy but Jesus just doesn't want us to have life as an existence. He wants us to have it, what? Abundantly. What a promise, friends. Believe it. And Christ is not going to just, just to make us happy for a little while, then ditch us in the gutter. We have the assurance that, that he will be with us until the end. Turn with me to Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn with me to John 15:7. Let's claim some of these promises. Amen. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And just over in John 16:24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your jo joy may be full. Amen. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. So why is it so important to have this conversion experience now? Well-known texts for our Adventists. Just turn back to John 14, 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Just turn back to John 3.3. 3. And I just want to re-emphasize what Christ said to Nicodemus. John 3. Chapter 3, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Who agrees that we're living in the last days? You know, we're Nebuchadnezzar's statue, we're right down in the little ends of those toes, aren't we, brothers and sisters? In Matthew 24 and 37 to 8, 38, Do you believe these things are happening now? In, in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us some signs that we, might, that we might know when to expect him. The moon shall not give its light. The, sh the sun shall be darkened. The stars shall fall from heaven. There shall be earthquakes, famines and pestilences. Look around the world how these things are, acc are accumulating. More and more often, earthquakes everywhere. Men shall be lovers of their own selves without natural affection. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets. There shall be wars and rumours of wars. All these things have happened and are happening now. 
Just turn with me to uh, Matthew 24, 33. I've, I've just got a short quote, quotation of that. Christ says, When you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. In verse 44, he says, To be ready. We need to be ready now. Let's read Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Just turn over to Matthew 24. And we want to consider verses 48 to 51. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over his goods. But he, but, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servant, and to eat and drink with the drunken, and the Lord of the servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour that he is not aware of. And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the faithful servant will be found ready. Satan puts into our minds the attitude of the evil servant because he does not want one of us to be saved. He is stronger now than ever. Just to confirm that, let's consider Revelation 12. Revelation 12 and verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. I read in great controversy, page 519, Satan well knows all whom he can lead. Every possible device to engross the mind. In Matthew 24, verse 24, we are told, If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. As he distracts us away from our prayer and study time with the Lord, we get the attitude of the evil servant, thinking I'll be safe to keep doing these earthly things a little longer and the Lord hasn't come yet. Just turn back with me to 2 Peter 3.9, please. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance Amen. in verse uh, friends you know we're the last church we're the last movement on, for Christ we're the church of Laodicea we are asleep. The Bible tells us that we are asleep. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This is the problem with us in the church today. We are convicted but not converted. Whether we are ready or not, Christ will come. Sister White writes about this and she says that few will be ready. Many will be found wanting. She's not talking about unbelievers here. She's talking about professing Christians. Those that are waiting, those that, are, that say that they are expecting his coming, she's talking about us. Before the flood, how many people were on the earth? A thousand? Five thousand? Five, millions. Think about a man's lifespan. Average lifespan, maybe 960 years. From creation to the flood, approximately 1,600 years. How many children could be had in that lifespan? Think about it. In Genesis 6.13, God said that the earth was filled with violence. So out of the millions that were alive on the earth at that time, God found only one man that was righteous, and that was Noah. There were only eight souls saved from that antediluvian world. Friends, God cannot wait forever. And in my opinion, he has been more than patient and more than gracious with us. Soon he will say, in Revelation 22, 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Let him be, right, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The question is, 
Are we ready? Are we prepared now to meet our Lord if he come tomorrow? Look at the condition of the world. It's hideous. The crime. The suffering. Anything goes. Economic crisis. Total disregard for life and for what God says. Anything, anything and everything is in regards to political correctness. The Pope is gaining power. And where is America? She's now holding hands with the papal power. The Pope has now, in recent times, been to Jerusalem for the first time in history. He went to the holy place and put a prayer paper in the holy wall. He is declaring peace amongst the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews. He has been to America in recent times, the country that represents Protestant Christianity. By this, they have given him, the beast, the so-called false vicar of Christ, homage. He is talking of one world religion. All the world leaders are talking of one world order. Everything is set for the last great crisis. Satan's army is ready. The question is, are we ready? Is God's church ready? Do we show in our lives every day that we are ready and waiting to meet our Lord? We each have the conviction to do, conviction, and do you know where it's coming from? It's Christ knocking on the door of our hearts, Revelation 3.20. Can we open the door, friends, or is there too much rubbish of the world jamming the door shut? Revelation 3.18, we need to ask God to help our unbelief so that we can have spiritual eyes. The spiritual minded, be spiritual minded so that the door can be open and Jesus can come in and sup with us. Yes, I believe time is short. And I believe he is not knocking any longer, he's banging on the doors of our hearts. But still, we don't let him in fully. The conviction that we have in our hearts now will not change us or make us more worthy unless we open the door, clearing away the rubbish, allowing him to change us, turning the conviction into true conviction. Conversion. It all comes down to us, brothers and sisters, choices as to what path we take when we walk out of here today. As to whether we will be just convicted or whether we will open the door for Jesus and be truly converted, thereby changing our lives for him. And it's my prayer that we can do, all do what Paul says in Philippians 3.13. Just turn with me to Philippians 3.13. Brethren, I count not myself to, appre to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. In verse 14, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. And lastly, what does Peter have to say after he was converted? Let's have a look at what Peter had to say in Acts 3. Acts 3. In chapter, uh, Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It's time, brothers and sisters, it's high time to stop playing games with God. You're either in or you're out. There can be no fence sitters, for God will not have sin rise a second time. The cost has been too high to heaven. This morning is my prayer that we would be more diligent to study and pray often as you can, and that it will lead us all into a personal, intimate experience and relationship with Jesus and having a true conversion, life changing experience. Ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ask how you can have more of him to help us grow into the fullness of Christ so that when Christ stands and says it's finished, we will not be found unjust or filthy, but we will be found righteous and holy and hear the words of the King of Kings saying, 
One, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. May, may God add his blessing to these words. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll end our, 